My name is Dr. Robert Gould. I've been president of the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility for since 1989, and I've also been on the National Board of Physicians for Social Responsibility since 1993. I served as president of Physicians for Social Responsibility in 2003, and I'm currently national president again this year, 2014. And so you're where now and why? Well, we're in Livermore as we have been for year after year, which is distressing in terms of the fact that Livermore Lab has continued to play a central role in the development of nuclear weapons. And we in PSR, together with our international Nobel Prize winning organization, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, have continued to speak out uh, for health professionals about the need for the abolition of nuclear weapons. We as health professionals have long recognized since the founding uh, of our organization back in the early 1960s that it is delusional to think that there can be any health response to nuclear weapons once they detonate because of the health uh, impacts due to heat, blast, and radiation, which caused the deaths of over 210,000 human beings in Japan by the end of 1945 and continue to plague the world with the impacts of radiation in the form of a variety of chronic diseases, developmental problems, as well as cancer. Um, so these are the issues that are central to physicians and other health professionals working with PSR. We're, we also, given that our organization opposes nuclear power because we, we think that there's been amply demonstrated problems related to uh, storage of nuclear waste, safety in operations, uh, the fact that uh, it's always been a central issue for PSR that inevitably countries, and we've seen it by history, that many countries who have had nuclear power programs have a path to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. This is of particular concern to us most recently because of the U.S.-India nuclear deal whereby India, which is not a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty, is being provided by the U.S. Uh, support for high-level uh, technical nuclear programs that allow the Indian government to free up its resources to develop nuclear weapons while we're giving them the aid on nuclear power development. We're very concerned about the double standard that that shows, but probably more important and which is a central issue for PSR and IPPNW as well as our colleagues within ICANN, the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, is the fact that even a small nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, not a full-fledged thermonuclear exchange between the U.S. and Russia, which of course, given the situation in the Ukraine, is still a danger for us. Even a small exchange within regional powers can have global impacts. So there's been recent uh, research that's indicated that, a rel again, a relatively small number of weapons exchanged between India and Pakistan could, through the incineration of multiple cities on each side of the border, lead to so much soot and pollutants getting raised by the incineration of cities that it would block out the sunlight, leading to a plunge in global temperatures over the next 10 years. And by dint of that type of particulate matter, etc., blocking out sunlight lead to a fall in food production. So our latest estimates that such an exchange could likely lead to worldwide malnutrition with deaths from malnutrition anywhere from 1 billion to 2 billion, depending on how many weapons are exchanged. So we now, it's certainly not offering that as an antidote to global warming, to be incinerating that many nuclear weapons, but we certainly understand the gravity of the situation, particularly when our policies feed that type of proliferation. So we just think it's time to abolish nuclear weapons, and we're very pleased that there's now an international movement within ICANN that the majority of the world's governments are supporting this, but we have to move on our country and the rest of the nuclear weapon states to heed the voice of, of people around the world. 
we don't need you know the hundreds of billions of dollars that are going to go into nuclear weapons programs where and I could speak as a physician we are not having enough money to provide people decent health care we're not dealing with major public health problems and we certainly aren't developed have the resources to be able to deal with the real problems posed by global warming so it's time to get straight as a world community to get together get rid of these weapons and deal with the real problems that we have at, our, at hand and yet there's a plan to develop uh, more better nuclear weapons and delivery systems over the next couple of decades. How do you square that with the objective to abolish? Well, I think you've hit on the central contradiction, Jim. I mean, you know, we were pleased when President Obama in Prague announced that his support for a world without nuclear weapons, but we haven't seen that when we actually look at the programs of, as you're indicating, modernization programs within the Department of Energy like here at Livermore, which are feeding the designs to make our weapons much more powerful and much more accurate. And our feeling is that, that that's craziness in the sense that actually would provide, uh, make these weapons, uh, quote unquote, more usable. And uh, this is a lot of the problems that we have about the real Orwellian language of Livermore and other folks within the Department of Energy to say they're building this for safety and reliability. We're talking about safety, we're talking about, you're talking about nuclear weapons, that you could have accidents. Eric Schlosser's recent book, Command and Control, illustrate the safety problems that way, that, that's endemic in our nuclear stockpile. We're talking about reliability for these new weapons. We're talking about greater assuredness that we can kill people around the world uh, at a distance. So I just think that's folly and just another reason why we're here. Can you talk about the... Um the health effects that we already are experiencing as a species from uh, the use and the production of the weapons so far? Well, there have been a number of examples of, of uh, accumulating evidence of, of the impacts of, of certainly uh, nuclear, the initial nuclear weapons impacts that were studied by the survivors of the Japanese detonations, the Hibakusha. And the series of, uh, of reports that have come out from the National Academy of Science with the, uh, on the biological effects of ionizing radiation have indicated progressively that there is no safe level of radiation because we know that all radiation is going to increase the number of mutations that could lead to cancer and can also have impacts on a population basis of a variety of diseases, autoimmune diseases, other chronic diseases as well. So, I mean, we live in a complex world where at the same time where we have these increasing radioactive hazards, such as the emissions from Fukushima, interact with a very polluted industrial base that we have worldwide in terms of chemicals that we produce, the 83,000 or so chemicals that are out there. So we're toying with the species in terms of these very deadly technologies and that we can already see in wildlife, for example, significant impacts on reproductive uh, outcomes and things like that. So this is a significant input into those those causes of disease that we certainly understand. So, you know, we, we certainly, and you know, the other thing I would add is that we can't just look at, you know, what are the impacts of a nuclear detonation or in a, you know, a release of radiation such as Fukushima. We have to look when we're, for example, looking at nuclear power, the whole life cycle of it and its broad impacts, not just on the individuals who might eat the tainted salmon, say from, from Fukushima, but everywhere along the line, from the people who like largely uh, First Nations, Navajos who are mining uranium, getting exposed to that, the communities that have the, the uranium tailings, all the way up to the over 600,000 workers in the Department of Energy sites and others who expose in the development of nuclear weapons, and the communities all around the world are completely at risk people today spoke about the importance of the Marshall Islands suit. This is a, a community from the Pacific Islands who were basically toyed with in terms of giving up their islands so we could detonate them for nuclear testing and been left with the residue of radioactive contamination and a whole variety of other problems that result from their dislocation from their culture and their livelihood. And it's so important that the Marshall Islands have done us a service 
by initiating a suit against a nuclear weapon state to stop this, not for just, just their legacy issues, but for the rest of the world, that this is madness that should not be generalized in our experience. I get back to my grandchildren again, you know, do I want my grandchildren to grow up in a world like this? I'm glad they're here today, but all of us have to talk to our families about this. This is an issue that's so much about family values, if you're really thinking long term, and about, like, you know, what, where's our planet heading? Thank you.